On this episode of The State of Happiness, we have as a special guest my husband, Franck Juvenecker. He's going to be joining me as I tell my story about postpartum depression in honor of Mother's Day and May, Mental Health Awareness Month. We're going to be talking about my journey, the symptoms of postpartum depression, what helped me get through it, and his story. How did he cope with my experience with depression and his tips on partners who are living with a loved one, a mother, who is dealing with her own experience of postpartum depression and anxiety. Stay tuned. Welcome to the State of Happiness. I'm your host, Leslie Juvena Gare, Chief Happiness Officer at Leslie Inc., where we provide solutions for finding happiness for stressed, anxious, and overwhelmed senior level managers, executives, and entrepreneurs. The State of Happiness podcast offers you conversation, inspiration, and ideas for helping you increase your happiness in the areas of your personal relationships, your career, your abundance, and your emotional well-being. So come along with us on this episode and we'll help you get the tools, resources, and inspiration you need to help you find your own state of happiness. Thanks for joining us on this episode, Frank. Yeah, thanks for inviting me. I'm happy that we are able to talk about postpartum depression, that we can actually look back at this having been through it and moved on from it. I feel though that postpartum depression is such an underestimated mental and mood disorder that a lot of people don't talk about it, but it's really common. Statistically, there's about a million mothers in the US at any given moment who is experiencing postpartum depression and anxiety. And statistically, they also say that one in seven mothers will experience it, and even more will experience baby blues, a sudden onset of um, emotional changes, teariness that accompany the birth of a child. I want to talk about our story because I think it's important that we tell a little bit more about it, illuminate the story, and inspire and empower people who might be listening to this episode right now and dealing with postpartum depression, anxiety, or any kind of um, mental, emotional illness that they might be experiencing surrounding the birth of a child. I know it was really hard for you. You yourself went through a depression during that time because it was really, really tough. Um, so I want men or partners of mothers to hear the story, to find out how you coped and yeah. your tips and how they can move forward too because people will get past this. They will get through it. It might take a little bit longer, um, but it is possible to get through it, but not without some help. So let's start the story. That's for sure. So let's talk about being pregnant. It was a tough pregnancy with Harper, our daughter, who is now five. I had pretty difficult pregnancy because for quite a while I was on bed rest and we were also living in an apartment that was really unhealthy. This woman um, who was our landlord didn't take responsibility for the moisture that was building up in our apartment and it became unhealthy and unsanitary for us to live in it. And not to mention that she became very violent towards us when we asked her to remediate the mold and the problems. So much so that the city got involved and looked at us like, why are you living here with this mentally imbalanced woman who doesn't want to do what's right? And so at that time we had a very stressful moment and we had to move within a few weeks of Harper being born. I had, um, my legs were swelling. It was difficult for me to walk and I had to help move and paint and do all this stuff. And I wasn't sleeping very well. It was a tough experience. And then I gave birth and because it was a 26 hour labor, within five minutes of having a cesarean, um, Harper made her way out. And then afterwards she was told to stay, or we were told to stay in the hospital for eight days, and she was in the neonatal intensive care unit 
to receive antibiotics and medication to stave off any infection because of the meconium that was in her sack that was yeah. building up at that time. So it was a very stressful situation. And also on top of that, I wasn't sleeping very well. I think now that I look back, the signs and symptoms were, were there, um, but it hadn't hit me yet. It was almost like I was against this ticking clock that I felt like there was this constant sense of urgency. Um, and I had this little baby who I was just really obsessively taking care of. Um, and I remember they gave us like a little chart of when she pooed and peed and, you know, ate and everything and yeah. slept. And I recorded yeah. all of that. And I have that still, that chart. That's funny. I didn't, I didn't know you had that chart. I do. I still have it okay. somewhere. And, uh, and I wasn't sleeping. And also in the hospital, even though France is champion for being healthy, I mean, the breakfasts were really sad. It was like a cup of hot cocoa and a bread and some butter and jam. And it was like the worst possible <laughs> breakfast that a new mother could have. I was so freaking hungry. You would bring me McDonald's just so I could have a proper meal. <laughs> I was so hungry. <laughs> so I wasn't sleeping, wasn't eating very well. I didn't have any real family support besides the nurses that were there. Um, so I didn't have a support system. All the signs and symptoms were already there. But what happened even more, I felt, I felt like, okay, I have this baby, now what? We didn't have any real family or support. No, no one, mm. honestly. Your parents didn't live in town. My parents were in the U.S. And um, just really feeling like, okay, I brought this baby home. I have to, like, do laundry and all these things and live as if I had done before. And that just wasn't going to work. So I felt a lot of pressure to be a mother and a wife and all of this at a very fast pace. And then on New Year's Eve, you took a selfie of us as yeah. a new family into the new year of 2013. And then I had a migraine. And a very I, violent migraine, yeah, I remember. And I woke up and I couldn't get out of bed. And that's when everything just stopped yeah it's time to kind of snowball so if my memory is correct it's like you had that migraine and so then it became well when only you were like super tired but it was also that worry kicked in of like you know how you can take care what will happen if you can cannot take care of you know the daughter because you were breastfeeding at that time so I think that was really a lot of pressure on you, like the, the breastfeeding part and being kind of the main uh, provider, I guess. Of her care? Of her care. Oh. That really worried you and it kind of almost made you even more stressed that it was kind of a chicken and an egg scenario here. Yeah, it was like this fear that I wasn't going to be able to take care of her. And it was a really bad fear. And we had a midwife and we had, you know, doctors and everything. And we would go to them and I'm like, I have this really bad anxiety and I'm really scared. I keep having these ruminating thoughts and also I was having scary thoughts, seeing visions of you know children being hurt and being afraid that I would hurt my own child. And it was very scary. It was like I was living in this world of uncontrolled thoughts that I didn't want to think and that I didn't have any power over and could not stop. So I had these symptoms of ruminating thoughts, fears that I wouldn't be able to take care of my child. I had really bad stomach issues. I mean, so bad I was bedridden. And you know, they say the stomach is the brain of the body. Mm. So it was just, I felt like my whole body and mind and spirit was like rebelling against me. And I remember going to the midwife and she's like, well, you know, you're supposed to raise your child and your child is, you're supposed to raise them and, and they're gonna go on and live their own lives. And I just felt when I was in that time, even as I look back and as someone who helps people with, you know, emotional um, overwhelm and, and issues, I'm going like, this lady had no freaking clue what I was talking about. She had she had no understanding as a midwife who's dealt with probably a thousand mothers. She had no clue what I was going through and was giving me some weird arbitrary advice about how we're supposed to raise our children. And, and I was just going like, yeah, I think what's going on here is much more deeper than that. And I knew I couldn't count on her for that support. And it wasn't until I think it was a month, six weeks after your brother, who's a psychiatrist, Stefan, 
said, you know, I think you have postpartum depression and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a depression that comes after the birth of a baby. And he was like the real, the nicest person yeah. in the whole situation. Yeah, it was very helpful. Well, I mean, your brother's a really gentle guy when it comes to this stuff. And he said, you know, I think you have this. You should go to a psychiatrist and go to a generalist and talk to them. And I remember going to Cedric, who was our generalist at the time, our general family doctor, who's now a friend of ours, and him saying, look, you're going through something. We're going to throw you a life raft. You just grab onto it. We'll be there to monitor you. Don't worry. Um, it's okay. We're going to hook you up with a psychiatrist. And then I saw the psychiatrist, and then she said, okay, we're going to put you on Zoloft to get you back to sleep. Because she was saying, you have not been sleeping. You really need to get back to sleep, and you need to... Um, start with that. So I started getting on a very low dosage of Zoloft. And if you're listening here, this is not an endorsement for Zoloft. This is just um, the path that I took. So just use your own intuition and your own expert advice that you trust. But that's what I did. And then I was able to sleep. I felt like, oh my god, I could finally sleep mm. and have a, a night's sleep. You stepped up and took a lot of help in taking care of Harper at night so I could sleep yeah. um, but then as I was sleeping I started to get dreams and the dreams were of the psychic nature and that was where everything started to change for me intuitively so along the same path this mental illness and this emotional disorder was also opening the door to my own psychic abilities and that's why I always tell people, if you're going through something where your emotions or your mind are kind of losing control, you must also be going through some kind of spiritual growth or awakening in your consciousness that is helping you to let go of the past and awaken this new future. So I was experiencing this, and fortunately, I found a friend named Raphael who had a son born one month after Harper. And we were able to talk openly about these psychic things that I was experiencing, her being a healer herself. And I felt like I had a comrade in this experience, especially because she was going through um, a lighter case of baby blues after the birth of her child. So things were starting to come together magically because I met her at a, a mother and me class. In France, they have the Protection of Mothers and Infants organization all over France, and you could go there and get help and support. And I met her, and my French was not the greatest. And I was like, I'm, look, I'm here to look for friends. Does anyone want to be friends? I was very blunt. And, you know, French people are like, what? 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 And she That's was funny. like, she came to me, and she's like, here's my number. Call me. And I called her right away. And her husband was like, this girl must be serious, call her back. So that's how we became friends. So I did begin to build, through this experience of postpartum depression, friends, you know, people who were looking out for me. I mean, they didn't have all the answers. Like, the doctors didn't know. I'd go to the psychiatrist and say, hey, I'm having these visions. She'd be like, okay, maybe you need to talk to somebody else. So then I went and talked to what was called, like, a social worker in France. Mm. And the social worker lady she was open to my intuitive abilities and the things that were opening up for me. And so she would let me talk about them and not judge me. Especially I'd been like, I see your energy around you when it's yellow and it's this and that. And I see a house and blah, blah, blah. And, and she would confirm all of these things. So it was like a great experience to begin to have a network of people who are not just seeing me as crazy, but seeing me as someone with something that was coming forward that was worth to be explored. Um, and also what happened was I was also exploring different healing techniques. So we did acupun acupuncture, hypnosis, we did aroma therapy. I tried Bach healing essences and uh, flower essences, um, rescue remedy from Bach. We did all sorts of different things to help me naturally and holistically get me back on path. So yes, we did take the medicine route, but I also did other things. So it was acupressure, acupuncture, Bach um, flower remedies, Bach rescue remedies. I did um, change my diet. I went on the acid alkaline diet. 
and I got exercise. I read the Edgar Casey readings, and they talk about how to overcome depression. I began to develop my ideals. So I began to enter a regime of self-love and self-care, and that really helped me move forward. Um, but for you, it all wasn't always so easy because you were there seeing me in the darkest of moments and the moments where I was like, I know why people commit suicide. I remember your face when I told you that. You just looked at me like you were like a, like a ghost, <laughs> like you had seen a ghost. You were like, oh my God, I'm scared. So take us into your experience. I tell my experience in a summary, um, but take us into your experience starting from the beginning and what happened for you. Yeah, so I mean, like right now, as you just, you know, talk back to that moment in our life, I mean, the, the way you say it doesn't sound that bad, but it was, it was pretty terrifying to, to, to put it honestly. Um, came time, you know, it's, uh, I mean, after or later during that podcast, I can give, you know, advice on how I approached it, but already from my point of view, when I saw you, it's, uh, it was getting darker and darker, like day after day, you know, it was first that kind of migraine that, you know, kind of got sick for a couple of days and then it's really like lack of sleep, like you are starting to just be almost like a zombie, you know, in some way. And, and then it was time where, you know, you were in bed, you couldn't move, you were like just shaking and crying and mm -hmm. being in the dark, you know, in the middle of the day and tell me like I understand why people want to commit suicide or I don't know if I can do it like I mean it was really time when I had to I think I called the the firefighter department or something when I was really scared that you were going to kind of commit suicide or something so it's uh you know and at the same time you know it's having that wonderful little newborn life and it's like Man, it should be the happiest moment in your life, in my life and our life. But it's, uh, you know, at the same time, it was the most saddest time in our life. Mm -hmm. So you're kind of emotional talking about it. Yeah. What What do you feel when you think about that? Uh, well, it's uh, it's it's mixed feeling. It's uh. Really, when I, I look back, you know, and I share kind of what was happening to colleagues, it's not like I have a huge amount of friends, and but most of the guy would be like, well, you know, she should be happy. She has a she has a new baby, like you know, it will it will pass, like just you know, like and I think I took a completely different path and instead of kind of trying to shake you and just be like, like. It's like you are physically, you know, you are physically broken. Yes, there is no broken bone, but it's it, it's the same, you know. It's like there is connection in the brain that are broken, and then no matter what you say, it's it's not going to heal, to heal the the bone, you know, in some way or the the brain. So, I took a different approach, approach, and I don't think I ever mentioned that once when. You know, I would come back from work or sometimes I would completely like skip work for a couple of weeks. I think I stay home. But I don't think I ever told you like, oh, come on, you should be happy. You know, you have a No, baby. you were never, never, you, thank God. Yeah. Uh, you were never like that. You were always just like, you had kid gloves and you were very gentle and you just said, what do you need? How can I help? What can I do? And... Sometimes I didn't know the answer, and all I would say is, you know, I just need you to be here, or I just need you to listen, or, you know, take care of her, whatever. Yeah, and I, I think when you even shared things that, you know, really, because I'm not, you know, in your brain, so you were sharing things that I really didn't understand, like that level of sadness and despair, and it's hard to just talk about your daily life and just be like, well, th thanks, babe, for sharing uh, me at work. I did this and that today. So like 
it's really a weird momentum where you cannot really, I didn't really know what to say to you. You know, I couldn't say, well, I'll be happy because it's not going to change anything. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I was not talking about my work, kind of useless. So just, yeah, for everyone out there, you know, it's just be a shoulder where, you know, you just listen and in every little way you just show support it's either you know getting groceries doing the dishes making sure that kind of making sure that your partner doesn't need to have to do anything else but to just take care of themselves right yeah i think the thing that was successful even though it took nine months it was a nine month process um they took medication it took going to doctors and I think the thing that was the most powerful was the attitude that you approach to it, which was this. I don't know what's happening. I'm out of control, but I'm not going to stop finding a solution until things get better. And you were very patient and very persistent, and you made your choices every day towards being not necessarily resolving it and fixing me, but looking for ways to make it better. Yeah. And, and that was like the thing that I think bonded us more than ever in our marriage. I think we were together for seven years at that time. But yeah. So, I mean, you know, looking back, I, I really feel, you know, our journey in, into this was definitely not perfect looking back. Like, um, when you were having lack of sleep, you know, you were still, even me, I was kind of feeling, well, you know, you should still, it's not like I say, but I, I didn't force you to stop breastfeeding at night. You know, I think, I think pretty early, it's important to think that the spouse health, health is more important than, you know, breastfeeding. You can still give baby butter and the baby will be totally fine. So looking back, I think, you know, it's really important to catch this hurry. Yeah, catch and it we, early. And we kind of, there was a solid month where we didn't really do anything. Anything, mm -hmm. or a month and a half. So I think as soon as you see the first sign, um, and in France, it's easy to take days off and stuff in for the partner, but I recommend that even here, just sacrifice, yeah, a couple of, or you know, take your sick days or paid vacation to just really in an early stage to show, you know, to take over pretty much to make sure that your partner can rest. And um, yeah, so that's, that's really important. Just uh, really act quickly and John doesn't, uh, don't let it kind of degrade, I guess. Well, prevention is the best cure. Yeah. So for me, if, if you know what happened, the next pregnancy was we made efforts to make sure I got more than enough sleep, and that I ate a really good, healthy, warm diet that did not overstress my digestive system. Um, we took things super easy. We did not stress ourselves with much. We didn't go, you know, crazy on planning. It was just like take it one day at a time, slow down. Mother's health is number one. Um, not putting any expectations on ourselves or on myself as a mother, how you know the baby would be, um, and making sure that my emotional, my spiritual, and my mental and my physical was all balanced. So that was something that you know, we go into overdrive. I think new mothers are in, in postpartum depression can skip the first child and go to the second child. Um, that's happened with many famous women that has been reported. I think um, Drew Barrymore talked about that um, and other mothers. So it's, it's going like sometimes life brings stressful things. Also, <coughs> at the same time, like I said, my soul chose to experience this experience to experience the spiritual growth and to come into my own intuitive abilities because hormones are directly connected to your own psychic abilities 
you know, your hormonal glands, motherhood, obviously your hormonal glands are all over the place. And then psychic abilities are directly tied to your own hormonal glands as well. So for me, I know my my soul signed up for this, um, but that was not something I wanted to do again. So I made sure that the next time around I did the efforts to make sure prevention was the best cure for any kind of experience that would come. I did still have anxiety, um, but again, that was more of the spiritual abilities opening up, but the depression feeling like, I, there was moments I was like, oh my God, I am completely changed as a person. Um, I don't think I'll ever be the same happy me. I think that I'm broken and I'll be mentally ill forever. And that was like a real thought and worry. And it took a lot of people to convince me that's not true and a lot of work to move past that belief that, oh great I'm broken and I will be like this forever and I'll never get to enjoy being a mother and motherhood will be nothing but scary and overwhelming Um, but also it's interesting as I look back having gone through it I look back as myself and being feeling very proud of myself as a mother because even though I was that way I made the choice to be present for Harper to love her to be the very best I possibly could and at the same time I learned I can't motherhood is not doing it on your own it's about sharing the responsibility with others in your community your family your spouse partner Um, and fortunately getting help from our nanny who came in in about three months gave me the time to to take care of myself and do those things for me so that was a really important part of the process But for you, you ended up being diagnosed with depression too at that time and you got on medication for I think six months? Yeah, six months. So really it was kind of I think the first five months of your uh, depression like you know I was kind of your your rock and you were like my little barnacle you know and and I hold like still and strong for really as long as I could but then, you know, I was kind of depleted at some point. I was just like... Yeah, you were emotionally and mentally and, and yeah. physically drained. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, obviously I was worried about you for, you know, months. And I was just, yeah, I, I needed at least some, someone else to share, you know, to share my stress. So that's why I kind of went to a psych, psychologue or social... Oh yeah. Social psychologist. Yeah, social psychologist. And then, and yeah, just uh, prescribe a bit of uh, and how you call that in English? Antidepression. Anti- yeah, antidepression, just to. And it's not like a. Again, like I mean, maybe it was how I did it. It's not a really a magic pill, you know. It's it's not like you are going to see all the life in with rainbows and like everything is pretty. It's just make you a bit less worry and that's how the doctor prescribed it to me. So yeah, please make sure to just, you know, talk with your doctor about what's right for for, for you. Everyone is different. Well, and also on top of that, you had to emotionally process your feeling of being with someone who experiences too. Because you didn't sign up for this on a conscious level. Your soul agreed to go through this. But on a conscious level, you were you were kind of hit by a bus with all of this that had happened. So Mother's Day is come and gone this month. And we want to talk about how can a father, a spouse, a family member support a mother who is going through a postpartum phase of depression or anxiety or any part of the spectrum of that mood disorder. What did you learn from my experience and from our shared experience? Um, I really think from this experience, I, I really understood how to step in. You know, and it's like at some point, you know, I went, I did almost everything else. And, you know, you, you were taking care still of Harper. I was, I was helping a lot with, with her too. But it's, you know, just making sure you just take on, on all the house duties, you know. It's uh, just let 
worry free on that part so i think that's kind of what i learned is to really step in and be a support and and even if you don't understand everything just be a good listening here and just show that you know you are here on a journey to to recovery there is a temptation for people who are living with someone who's experiencing a mood disorder to try to want to fix them and if they get frustrated when they can't make a difference and then they become resentful my advice for that is to know that it's not your job to fix your loved one who's experiencing postpartum depression or anxiety it's just your job to bear witness to their journey and that yeah your life is going to be impacted by their experience they might not be able to laugh at all your jokes or be there or do things for you that they had done before yeah in a way that the person that you love is not there right now they're not available right now and in their place you have somebody else who has a cloud over them um, that is keeping them from truly shining you have to be patient and you have to put yourself and what you get what you want out of that picture because they cannot give you all those things that you were giving before so let that go any expectation of the old way or the way things were that's going to have to disappear um, and I've seen that a lot too with clients whose spouses are dealing with some kind of thing and they want to change it or whatever and it's like guess what they can't show up for you in the ways that you want let them go through their thing and when they get their energy back and when that person truly comes back they'll be able to do those things but they're not going to be able to deliver the ways that they used to before and probably maybe even never again um, sometimes that the, the behaviors the attitudes that led to the depression will be gone because the person goes well if I want to be healthy I can't do those behaviors anymore can't have those attitudes anymore and they'll change so embrace that change embrace who this woman is becoming because if she's a new mother she's becoming a new mother if she's a mother of multiple children um, she's evolving as well so don't let yourself get caught up in what you lose focus on what you gain from this experience and the journey because there's so much to learn and so much to gain from the journey of depression and anxiety and remember depression and anxiety are just information it's just got information in there and it's our job to sort through that information to find out what's really happening for me it was an awakening of my psychic abilities it was releasing my fears that I got from a child it was a journey of self-realization and awakening so don't worry about what you lose. Focus on what you gain and what yet is to be explored. Yeah, I think you. I think it's a, yeah, it's a great advice, Leslie. Uh, another one that I come from an industry, the outdoor lifestyle industry. So a lot of people, you know, they go camping, they do trips, they do a lot of things on the weekend, and it's almost kind of. And maybe for you, you know, it's, uh, it's doing different things, but it's uh, a lot of people, I feel, they are like, oh, we are going to have the baby and it's not going to change our lifestyle. We are still going to do the same stuff. And, and, and really, like, and it's what we did. We had the Harper and then three weeks later, we drove like, you know, nine hours to go back to my parents' house and like just to visit them and stuff like that, that. Really, I think you should take it middle. It's the birth of your child. You should really kind of just really take it easy. They don't need much. They just want, you know, the baby just wants your love and attention. And and I think you should really spend your time focusing on them and not proving to the world that having a newborn is not going to change your lifestyle because it's going to and in good ways and you are going to, to love how, how they modify your life for the better. So... Yeah, just just for the sake of, you know, resting and really understanding baby habits and what needs to be done. Like, don't try to push yourself to prove things to the world because there is nothing to prove, you know. Well, that's interesting. That reminds me of some friends I had in France at that time who were actual medical professionals. And I remember... I was in full depression and really having like anxiety. I couldn't even leave the house. It was so difficult for me. Mm. And it was like 
climbing Mount Kilimanjaro or something. I, I mean, every little thing was like major laborious task and I remember these women were like well why don't you just come over and do this and that and you know and I'm like my baby's like a few months old like I'm by myself it's a winter like it was still snow on the ground (laughs) driving you know and and they were like come on out you shouldn't have to change your life because of a baby you could just put the baby in there and keep going and and I'm going like yeah no that's not true for me and there might be some women who pop the baby out and put the baby on the back, like Sacagawea, and walk across the country. God bless. But most women are not like that. And especially going through the period of, you know, being pregnant and being in the fourth trimester, which is the three, four months after your baby is born, there's still a lot of recovery, a lot of um, balance that your body must um, recuperate. And I remember these women were just like, why are you letting this bother you? Why are you acting this way? I mean, really having this attitude to me like I was just completely dysfunctional human being. There was something wrong with me or it was just like I was just not being a fun person or I was being a spoil sport. And if you're a friend of someone who's going through this, like give them space. Don't judge. Encourage them to advocate and take care of themselves but don't try to pressure them to meet your expectations of what they should be like um, as a friend or how they should show up for you because you're not going through what they're going through. You have no idea. Um, for me, when I hear somebody who's going through depression, I say, go get the help. Go get the help. If, if I can be there, you know, I'm a busy person. I can't be there yeah. for everybody. But I say, at worst case scenario, if things get really bad, bring the baby here, drop him off or come here. You're always welcome, but make sure you make sure you take care of yourself. Get the help you need. Don't wait another minute. Take care of yourself. And I think that also the final part I wanted to say it's like it's kind of taboo. I mean, we went from the mental health month, and and it's kind of taboo. I like to for people that really don't understand understand it. Really, like postpartum depression or any kind of depression. It's um, it's something you know, not like that you should be able to talk about. There is nothing taboo about, and you should go get help. It's it's almost like having a broken bone. You know, it's it's something broken in your body, and there is nothing to be ashamed of that. And as soon as you see a friend that has these signs, you know, you should just be like, hey, let's you know. Go go see a doctor, or it's and that because everything is f- um, fixable, you know, with the proper care. With the proper care, and if you are having a friend who's having postpartum depression or anxiety, you know, don't judge them. It's a phase; they will get through it. Um, don't worry about not having the answers or having to save them or whatever. Um, you know. Don't get me wrong, you know, some people have self-destructive behaviors that they've learned in the depression and anxiety state makes it worse and some of that may come out. You don't have to fall victim to manipulative behaviors, but when you're looking at someone who's really like, I can't get out of bed or I'm scared, you know, decide, discern for yourself when someone's trying to be manipulative and using you versus someone who's seriously, um, you know, in a sp- space of emotional and mental disorder and is just feeling helpless and doesn't know what to do. And again, you don't have to feel like you, you have to save them or rescue them, but you have to remind them, hey, the healing comes from within you. Hey, you can do this. Hey, you will get over this. Hey, you can get up. I can make the appointment. I'll drive you there. But you got to show up in that in that um, appointment and talk about your feelings and what you're going through. Like you can do this. So, if you're dealing with somebody who's experiencing this, you don't have to be the end all be all and their rescuer or savior. You just got to be present and non judgmental. And if you feel that someone in that stage is is taking advantage or is trying to hurt you, you'll know. You'll know the difference. Um, and you have to take care of yourself. So if someone's asking you who's in that state to do something that's outside of your normal healthy boundaries, well then say that and affirm that and create a healthy environment. That's a part of that process. And 
there's going to be many things that come up, stuff from childhood, maybe a past life thing, maybe a spiritual lesson, maybe maybe they need to take better care of themselves physically, whatever that might be, don't judge it, let that come forward and take a proactive choice towards treating it and giving yourself a state of mental and emotional well-being. Old things will pass away, bad behaviors, negative attitudes, old fears, childhood traumas, these things are going to come forward because depression and anxiety gives it that space to go, uh-oh, I've got a lot of imbalances, i got to deal with them. doesn't mean the person's a bad person or there's something fundamentally wrong with them. It just means that there's some things that just aren't adding up and it takes time to reconcile all of that. Depression and anxiety is treatable. It is... Um, something that will pass, but you got to give it the right attention and care, love, and a non-judgmental attitude. Don't shame someone who's going through something, but empower them to love themselves, take care of themselves, and to go on the journey of self-love and care. And that's where true recovery really begins. Frank, thank you so much for sharing your story with me. I know it was difficult for you at some moments to relive those memories. Um, I know how much you love me and how much you love being a father and you're a great dad and it was a very tough time to go through that. Any final thoughts? I just wanted to thank you for uh, letting me share share my story and how I was able to help you and help myself. Right, because you learned a lot about yourself in that process too as a person because you kind of were selfish before in your attitudes about pretty much everything. And going through this really helped to soften your heart and become less judgmental and less expectations on me and others and how you thought your life would be. So you did have your own spiritual lessons that you had to experience through this process. Yeah, I, I still don't see aura around people, but... Well, maybe you're not so psychic in that sense, but your, your intuitive empathic abilities to listen to other people and to not judge them where they are certainly has grown. Yeah. You've become a better person as a result of this experience. Thank you, and thanks for inviting me to this podcast. You're welcome. If you're dealing with postpartum depression or anxiety, there is hope. There are resources, and I will put them in the show notes. I've written more articles about this, and talking about postpartum depression and anxiety is something that I do as a service. If you would like me to come and be a guest on your show or be a guest in your event to speak about this issue let us know contact us you can email us at work happy at leslieinc.org remember postpartum depression and anxiety is not the end of your life it is the beginning of a new chapter of your life if you have questions or comments let us know write to us at hello at leslieinc.org reach out to us on all our social media ch- channels at Leslie Inc. on Instagram and official Leslie Inc. on Facebook. Thanks for tuning in. And remember, a smile goes a long way. Are you curious about how Leslie Inc. can help you find more happiness in your life? Whether you need more happiness in your career, your abundance, your relationships, or just your emotional well-being, we've got a solution that'll help you figure out where to start. Go to our website at leslieinc.org and take our happiness assessment. In less than two minutes, with 10 questions, you'll find out which area of your life could use more happiness and which guide pack we can use to help get you back to your state of happiness. A many thanks to you happy campers for joining us today on this episode of The State of Happiness. If you'd like to continue the conversation, you can join me at Twitter at Leslie Juven, as well as follow at Leslie Inc. on Instagram and talk with us at Facebook at Official Leslie Inc. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to leave us a rating and subscribe and share with a friend. As always, thanks for joining us and remember, a smile goes a long way.